Hello, and welcome to Weed and Grub. I was thinking about like my pandemic body and how I haven't added cells to my body, but the cells that I do have are just like feeling themselves. Yeah, they're, you know what I mean. I feel you. Wait, that you your cells are like my at cells their are in, fullest. They're in sweatpants. Oh, your cells are in sweats. <laughs> my cells are in sweats. <laughs> yep, they're all in like caftans and moo-moos, and they're all just like are they happy hanging out? They feel fine. They're happy. They're happy to be alive. Are your cells on vacation, or are they or are they thick? So they went from wearing a um, a, a thirty. 430 like myself to right. a 3630 like myself. I mean, I'm not going to my cells are not going to uh, grade themselves on size, but they Damn are right. they're feeling they're feeling very loose. I will say that they are more akin to like instead of like a beach ball, they're more like water balloon <laughs> kind of situation. You know what I mean? And they're all just hanging uh -huh. and I'm glad they're all there and um, I'm grateful for them um, but I, it is time to take them all on a hike <laughs> all my cells get need off to go the on a cruise hike. ship yep get back to reality get back to reality I'm with you everybody listen I'm talking to you go to my cells I'm currently addressing my cells I'm taking you all on a hike this weekend we're gonna do it nice it's they're gonna, gonna love good. it they're gonna sweat <laughs> they're gonna feel good you're gonna sell sweat I can just picture all my cells in little sweatbands now with like the little you know like flat Dance style, yeah. like de -ne 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 -ne. pinks and blues, Easter colors, doing that like workout jam. Yep, those are your cells. Yep, my Hell cells. Yeah. Are, they're gonna get dressed up in Easter colors. They're gonna, you know, get put on some hard pants. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think there's queen cells, like, like in a beehive? Oh, I wonder. Yeah, you have the one main cell that dictates everything else. Yeah, I feel like because I don't know if you have the same type of cell all over your body and wherever it is, it has like a job. Like I don't know if you can put a skin cell into a is a blood cell and a skin cell the same and if not is there skin cell leaders and blood cell leaders that's why stem cells are so interesting is because stem cells can actually become any kind of cell because cells do differentiate oh, well, then what are we depending doing? on where they are no wonder body. prince philip is just still around <laughs> that dude is filled with stem cells probably yeah i'm guessing you are correct as is tom cruise as are so many people. You know, I love that, like, have the fucking means. The the levels of of youth go Botox filler, stem cell filler. <laughs> right. Yeah, for sure. Well, no, in between there, there's also, uh, like, the transfusions like Keith Richards used to do famously, where he would just get his blood replaced. Respect. I googled it. Yeah. I googled full uh full body IVs and transfusions. Yeah. Just to see how much they would cost, because I'd love to do one. It's. Have you ever had a uh, vitamin B shot? Mm -mm. I was working on a Live Nation gig and they actually had someone coming because it was like really long, long days. And um, we all got uh, like a, a vitamin B shot and I felt amazing. That sounds great. Yeah, it was yeah. wonderful. Uh, your cells are, are, are thickening caftans right now. Mm -hmm. Mine need to be run through a sieve. Oh. I need to filter them. So yeah. that's my deal over here. I need to tap them. <laughs> Run them under some water. Yeah. Get the debris off because that cooking oil is a little too dirty inside me. Heard. You know what I mean? I need to run my... Uh I need to run my blood through a cheesecloth. Got it. You need. Yeah, it's like running shake through a screen to get the keef, <laughs> and then collect what's good and yeah. leave the rest behind, or you know, make some edibles with the rest. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Make edibles with your weird cells. Well, that's what goes back to like honestly, like I would love to put some stem cells inside me. I would absolutely. I'll, I'll try anything once, but I will probably try that twice. It's really important to support that up. kind of research. It's fascinating. Yeah. You know, there are all sorts of, um, you know, disease researchers and immunologists who um, are discovering things all the time with stem cell research. It's fascinating. Well, let's get some science on this fucking bitch. Let's get some scientists <laughs> on here, too. Let's get some science on this fucking bitch. I don't know. Bitch. You know what I'm saying? Like, I do. I want some science. Like, I want to know if there are queen cells, mm -hmm. and I want to know, I want a stem cell plug. Yep. Let's make friends with these people. Let's do it. I would love to talk to some. I would love to talk to an immunologist, and I would love to talk to to some biologists as well. I mean, with uh, Earth Day coming up this year, I feel like you know we could reach out to some climate change scientists and and get some answers and get Greta like, on what's here. What's happening? Yes, let's get Greta on here. Let's what's get up, Greta? Greta? We love you. <laughs>
<laughs> for real. She's a fan. She listens. Greta Thunberg listens to our podcast. Yeah, she listens every Wednesday, and she joined our Patreon. Great. Thanks. Thanks for the support. <laughs> you know what I mean? What yeah. up, Mary Jane? Oh, how's it going, Mike? Good, good, good. Welcome to Weed and Grub, everybody. This is a podcast about comedy. Cannabis. Culture. Cooking. And calling shit out. And climate change. And climate change. And stem cells. And stem cells. Yes. Yeah, 100%. Stem cells. I want to have those people on as well. Yeah, I would love to. I mean, I love the fact that we're highlighting all kinds of voices on this podcast, and it's really great to talk to people from all different backgrounds, and we haven't had any scientists on yet, as far as I know. I don't, well, besides you. Yeah. <laughs> no, not a scientist. I was actually the black sheep of my family, I thought, because uh, my grandmother was a marine biologist, and my father was a fishery scientist, and my sister is a fishery scientist, and I felt like by not following the family tradition, I was letting everyone down, but they told me that wasn't the case, so that was nice. It's not the case. Just because the trunk of the tree is one size doesn't mean that there are many branches on top. What? You got to go down your own road. Okay. Like your uh, your family tree has many limbs, so yes. there's it doesn't mean that you have to climb straight up like That's everybody true. else. It's true. I didn't have to become a biologist in order to make my family proud, but I am so proud of them and so impressed by the work that scientists all around the world are doing all the time and I feel like, you know, especially in celebrity culture, like, you know, no one no one is shouting out the hard work that the fucking scientists are doing for us. So let's get them on here and talk to them about, you know, cool stuff. Agreed. Cool science stuff. And also, when you said what, it didn't hurt my feelings. <laughs> it didn't? No, or because it did? a little, because I knew what I meant. And when you didn't understand it, I even made a hand motion upwards and it still didn't hit. My brain didn't follow it. I'm sorry. Sometimes it's weird, man. Growing up, I had so much trouble connecting with other kids because I would say something like I just said to you mm-hmm. and it would make perfect sense in my head. But because they're not in my head to see what I'm picturing, right. it goes over their head uh-huh. and i have i've grappled with that my entire life so much imagery in my fucking brain makes perfect sense to me and yeah. as soon as i say it out loud i go well there goes that friend because <laughs> you you had no idea what i meant and everyone around is now staring and yeah. that's real that is real i'm sorry sometimes i don't follow and um and i just need to clarify instead well, of pretending that i understand you i actually want to say i'm not clear on that and i would like to understand you so can you help me understand instead of just pretending that i know what you're talking about that's all that's a real one but i definitely didn't mean to like you no, know, it's my own, it. you know, I have thick cells and a thin skin. So, oh, you know what I'm saying? I hear you. Yeah. I hear you on that. I mean, it's great for things like when I did those BuzzFeed <laughs> videos, because then I can look at a sloth and be like, it's its own hammock, because yeah. that's how my brain works. Yep. But in everyday interactions, it can cause problems if I don't reel it in a bit. I love the way your brain works. And I love following along with like the weird places that it can take me. And sometimes I just, you know, but like the same thing is happens when like I got irritated because on a recent episode of, on our, on our Patreon, um, I was talking about Ravi Shankar and you thought I was talking about Ravi mm-hmm. and I was like, w- listen, rawr, rawr, and I got all bent out of shape about it because you didn't understand what I meant. Yep. So, you know, we can do that on here because we're buds and we, if I can get through it with some good weed and friendship. Fuck yeah, buds. <laughs> Damn, that's nice. There's like a rainbow between us. <laughs> Beep, boop, boop, boop. <laughs> Shing. Here, touch my finger. Ding. Ding. <laughs> Speaking of uh, thick cells. Yes. We tried a lot of new foods for our guest today, Bill Oakley, because he is such a fast food phenom. Yes. And so before we get to the news, I wanted to ask you about some of those foods. I am ready to talk about them. Cool. Very excited. So no fault of your own. Mm -hmm. You have never tried Taco Bell. Correct. Popeyes. Correct. Big Boys. Correct. Uh, Am I missing any of the mains? That was our, nope, those were our main three that we went to for Bell to prepare. Yeah. And last episode with Megan and Rachel Rapino, we talked about Popeyes and how you had a driving biscuit and you even sang about it. I did. But we did not talk about- Ready to sing it again anytime. (laughs) Yo, we got some nice DMs that were like, please make an EP. Yeah, they were really, they were really nice about it. Come on. I'm sorry I assaulted everyone's ears with that, but I will be bringing more songs on here because I had such a good time doing it, so. Good. I want to hear them. I want to hear them. (laughs) We'll, We'll release an EP of uh food songs and what does ep stand for um extra plate yeah (laughs) (laughs) that's your joke (laughs) i like it it's fun so i'd like to start with taco bell okay because it was an absolute honor to be there for your first taco bell bite ever thank you big deal it felt like a big deal uh i have always felt like a fucking fraud like how do you smoke weed and never have eaten taco bell 
honestly, I just, there was no Taco Bell where I grew up. And I then just somehow kind of never wanted to try it because I was always surrounded by like other great food. And I am so ashamed that I had never had it because the Crunch Wrap Supreme is like fucking legendary. It is legendary. Legendary. Yeah. Yes. What did you think of the Crunch Wrap Supreme? Listen. Cold Taco Bell? Oh, just... okay. You're right. We need to set up a little bit of context. Yeah. We hit three places in a row. We drove to Big Boys and got their double burger, which we'll get to in a second. And then mm-hmm. we drove to Popeye's and got the biscuit and two uh, Popeye's chicken sandwiches. And then we drove to Taco Bell and got a Crunchwrap Supreme, a Doritos Locos Taco, a um, regular, taco. regular Taco Supreme. And there's something else I'm blanking, but we have a picture of it for the Instagram. <laughs> and then we drove all the way back to my place to eat all of it. So right. by the time we got here, it you know, it's it's all driving food. Maybe that's what the album is. It's like driving Crunchwrap Supreme, driving Biscuit. That would be my feedback because by the time we got back here and tried everything, I feel like the Crunchwrap Supreme, you just got to eat it hot. Right there, right there when it gets to you. And it's crunchy and hot and gooey and all that kind of stuff. So I got a sense of the magnificence of the fucking brain that dreamed up that incredible snack. I didn't get the satisfying sort of experience of the crunch and the whole situation because it was just kind of kind of soggy by the time I got to it. Do you think that it was a bad crunch wrap, though, to begin with? Because it... Like, let's let's call it out. I think it's important because, you know, Taco Bell is not going anywhere. Right. And if you liked the flavors, that's great. Mm -hmm. Uh, If it wasn't crunchy, that's a problem. And I don't think that can all be blamed on a 10 minute car ride. It was like a longer car ride than that first, because I do want to say I definitely think that had I been had I had experienced it like in the car at Taco Bell, I would have had a better experience. But I um, didn't. I waited. And it was definitely like, I don't know. Are, do they differ from Taco Bell to Taco Bell? Isn't the idea that it's the What's same everywhere you go? I didn't. Quit dancing around didn't, what you think of it. I didn't love it. Okay. I didn't, I'm sorry. I don't want to let anyone down. <laughs> it's a big deal to say that you're like not a big fan of the thing that everyone's a fan of. That's a weird position to take. I get scared that people aren't going to like me, Mike. I'm worried <laughs> about people liking me all the time. I feel that. Constantly. It's very scary for me to come out against popular opinion and put myself on the line and be like, I didn't love it. It's like if you get kidnapped and they give you some water and it's like, do you guys want any? Yeah. I don't want to finish the glass. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. You? You? Yeah. Okay, cool. Everyone good? Yeah? You okay? (laughs) Oh, they're like beating the shit out of you. How's your hand? Is everybody feeling comfortable? No, it's like truly, you know, it's scary because... Everybody loves it. Uh, everybody talks about it. Everybody's like, the first thing that I want when I'm high is the Taco Bell Crunchwrap Supreme. And I had it and I didn't like it. And so I'm wondering what was wrong with me. <laughs> you know? That's weird. It's weird. That's a weird stance to take. What's wrong with me that I didn't like this thing? I don't know. I, I feel don't, you. Respect. I, don't, I also wasn't a big fan of like how salty everything was. It's mad salt. It's crazy salty. And I do love salt, but like that... Um, you know, that kind of level of salt when you're already ingesting, like, all of the other factors of the fast foodness, mm-hmm. Like, and especially because it was, you know, in comparison to the Big Boy Burger and the Popeye's Chicken Sandwiches, which were fucking delicious. Yeah, those are, those are like, restaurant quality at a lower price. Yes. Ooh, that feels too... Close to dough, dough boys, that sentence. Okay. I don't want to. I don't want to dough. I don't want to dive into dough boys territory. Right, with this. right, right. I think that's very important not totally. to do. Um, but I did want to talk quickly about the Big Boy Burger because it directly relates so strongly into uh, Bill Oakley, our guest today. Well, the reason that we had the Big Boy Burger was because it was Bill Oakley's number one fast food sandwich. Yes. And it is absolutely number one, even after the car ride. We tucked into it, you know, probably an hour after we'd bought it. And it was absolutely delicious. What you said about it was, I can taste the meat. I can taste the grill. Mm -hmm. It was made fresh. Everything was delicious. Yeah. And what I said was, this tastes like a burger that I could make at home if I really knew what I was doing. Exactly. And that brought me a lot of, like, backyard satisfaction. Yep. And that special sauce is just fucking bomb. Like, that recipe is delicious. It was a great balance of all of the, like, pickle and sweet and savory and it was fantastic yeah. great job and also just like a fun ordering experience driving up and the guy who was so excited to see us and he was like it's your first time here and we was just <laughs> yeah and we get into it Phil as well it was yeah it was just it was a good bite so I think that the Taco Bell experience suffered in comparison to the extremely excellent big boy burger and also the fucking delicious Popeye's chicken sandwiches I mean those sandwiches I'm still thinking about them I'm I am go too back to Burbank right now and get one truth 
Right? Yes. I like, wow. Yeah, yeah. I am too. And that's cool. Yeah. That's a cool experience <laughs> when you wake up thinking about a food. That's one of my favorite ways to wake up. It's, it's fantastic. I woke up this morning thinking about the leftovers in my fridge that I was really excited about. It's just a good oh, way to wake up. Oh, what leftovers are they? Oh, it was, uh, they weren't great, but I was excited about them anyway. It was Singapore My Fun Noodles, which is my favorite um, Chinese takeout dish. Like good cold curried cold curried noodles there's shrimp in those there's shrimp in there there's Ooh. egg in there oh yeah there's a little chicken in there oh man a mouthful of cold chinese noodles is... with like onions and peppers <laughs> it was like kind face. of a disgusting bite if anyone had like happened upon me but i had a great time eating it with my coffee <laughs> my favorite move that i did two days ago with leftovers was i poured my morning cup of coffee and i rested it on the top shelf of my open fridge uh-huh. and hunkered over leftovers filled them in my face and sipped coffee and there was a beautiful (laughs) sense of protection because you know how my windows you can see in my windows at the building across from me yeah but because of the way the door opens i could hide behind the fridge door and just like alternate between shoveling leftovers in my face and sipping coffee that was like slowly cooling on the air of the fridge and it was a, it was just a perfect 10 minutes this is very satisfying for you it was a beautiful move nice. it's a move that i can't wait to do again <laughs> i love it yeah do you want to awesome. get to the news yes let's get to the news oh we have our sponsor to shout out the grubla gazette is presented by ocb rolling papers the largest rolling paper brand in the world created naturally since 1918 ocb offers a full line of papers made with sustainable fibers no gmos and no chlorine all OCB materials are sustainably farmed from within a 500 kilometer radius, because they're in France, of their facility, which is powered by 100% green energy. 500 kilometers in U.S. distance? Is it's like a mile. Oh, like a mile? <laughs> oh, all right, that's pretty tight. <laughs> OCB introduced the world to the first natural rolling paper crafted with pure organic hemp grown in Champagne, France. Aww. We have them right here. If you're Champagne. on our Patreon, you can see. Um, oh, I'll wait until the end of the ad to talk more about the plug and the big box we received. What's next? Just as Mother Nature intended, trust your premium legal leap to the finest natural and sustainably crafted rolling papers in the world. Don't put your French champagne in a solo cup. Enjoy your entire smoking experience with OCB Premium Hemp Rolling Papers. This is very important. Visit OCBUSA.com and follow OCB on Instagram at OCB underscore USA. We also made a reel because of the plug that OCB is for ourselves. So check out our Instagram if you want to see all the rad stuff that they sent us. They sent us a huge box of hemp uh, and bamboo cones and hoodies and hats and rolling trays. I love anything organic that I could put in my body. I'm so excited because we've got great weed to roll up right now. We are very blessed with some wonderful flour. And so it's exciting to have some sustainably crafted hemp rolling papers to enjoy it with. If you like this podcast and you want to support us, Support OCB because if we support you and you support us and they support us and you support them, that is a happy family of support. We are all in it together. We are all limbs on this one big tree. Now you get it. Now I got it. <laughs> Should we get to the Grubla Gazette? Yes. Our Grubla Gazette news story this week is coming from Marijuana Business Daily, which is a great uh, website to visit for everything that's going on in the weed world. And it's about the cannabis banking reform that has been reintroduced in the U.S. Senate. So uh, we were talking about it last year because part of the problem with having a legal cannabis business is that you're not afforded access to basic banking services in many cases. And so you're a target for robbery and there's just all sorts of trouble doing business. 15 times? That one business got robbed 15 times because they're not allowed to put their money in a bank. Uh, That's right. So there was a bill passed by the House last year with an overwhelming bipartisan majority for safe banking, but it stalled in the Senate because then Majority Leader uh, Mitch McConnell, who was unfriendly toward all things weed, uh, just put a, crossed his arms against it with his turtle face and said no. You are but so now, kind with your word choices. Jeez Louise. Fuck face. Um, <laughs> but now that Congress is Democratic controlled by a, by a smidge, of course, we know that there are some Democrats who are voting against uh, things for that would move things forward, like Kristen Cinema, who's a fucking nightmare. But anyway... Uh, hopefully they'll do the right thing. So the bill's chances are improved with that uh, Democratic majority in the Senate. So let's hope that this actually passes. It sounds like with the world coming back online, the cannabis legalization is going to move ahead quickly to kind of boost our economy and get us out of a lot of jams. Mm -hmm. And I have a strong feeling that a version of this will pass within the next handful of months Mm -hmm. because... 
they know it's going to be legal. We know it's going to be legal. They are just going to lay the groundwork so that it favors them and screw the little guy, and then everything will be passed. So I feel like this is a step forward, but I'm going to, I'm going to, um, I'm going to bet that it's actually going to be two steps back in a lot of ways. Interesting. You know what well, I'm saying? We'll have to keep an eye on it. It's you know there are so many problems with cannabis legalization as we've spoken about with some fantastic guests like David Bienenstock who pointed out you know predatory capitalism is a huge <laughs> fucking nightmare and uh, you know hopefully the idea is that cannabis will con con what's the word can continue can cannabis will can continue no cannabis will transform capitalism that's what I was going to say conform but cannabis will uh, transform capitalism versus capitalism having its uh, kind of nasty effect on the plant. So let's hope that with making cannabis banking legal and giving access to banking services for all these small businesses, that'll just be a way to move everything ahead in the right direction. Absolutely. And when you and when you go there to um, make a withdrawal, you can mm -hmm. be like, "Hey, I'm cashed out." Oh, yep. Know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You can be like, "I'm cashed out." I'm cashed out. <laughs> <laughs> I, oh, I, I don't know enough about banking to understand how anything works. Right. Sometimes I'll open up my bank account and be like, what's this $5 fee for? And then close it again and not oh. even fight against it, even right. though I feel like I should just for micro injustice purposes. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I don't understand enough about this to do anything more than get angry when I learn more. Do you know what I'm sure. saying? Yeah, banks yeah. suck. I fucking wrote a letter to the Better Business Bureau last summer when Chase uh, froze my account because my IRS stimulus check, which was addressed to me and signed by then President Donald Trump, fucking bounced. <laughs> <laughs> Mother. In the man. middle of the fucking fuck. Oh, it was such a fucking nightmare. In the middle of everything that was going on, the whole country was in massive fucking upheaval and they froze access to my funds because the fucking stimulus check looked suspicious to them without telling me. I only found out when I tried to do a transaction and my debit card was declined and I was so upset because I was like, I, what if I like fucking got COVID and I needed access to money to like get to the fucking hospital or what if I just need grocery? What if I need to live with any of the money that you have? What do you mean? What if? Yeah. What if I need to live? <laughs> and uh, anyway, they were dicks about it. And I finally wrote to the Better Business Bureau and I got a very quick response, turn around, you know, formal letter from the executive meow meow. And it was still bullshit and nothing happened. But yeah, banks suck. Do you I was think... mad enough to write a formal complaint to the Better Business Bureau, like a super nerd. But... Real talk, that shit works. Do you think that <laughs> when it, there is this banking bill that's passed, credit unions would be the way to go for dispensaries? Because I'm looking into credit unions right now, yeah. and it seems like a pretty sweet fucking deal to me. I think the credit union, I'm looking into credit unions right now as well, and I think that they're great because they're owned by their members. They're like a co-op, basically. You know, everyone right. who buys in is then owns a small piece of the business. So the the problem with credit unions, I think, is that they just don't have the leverage that the larger banks do for like bigger loans and that kind of thing is my understanding. I so see. if you're a so. business and you need like a million dollar loan, mm -hmm. a credit union might not be able to supply it and you'll have to go to somewhere like fucking chase interesting but uh i think you know definitely at my level i don't have a million dollars so i'm gonna maybe close all my chase accounts and open up a credit union account that's gonna be feel so good and then i'm gonna withdraw money from that account and go buy weed with it yeah and then they're gonna take that money and they're gonna put it in their account yeah that's gonna be awesome <laughs> <laughs> banking's great <laughs> We can grab a banking podcast. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> you want to learn how to lose money quick on impulse buys I don't even at know. the grocery store front of the line? Seriously. Oh, I've never had that toffee before. I've been buying kombucha <laughs> like it's, you know, <laughs> water. That shit's expensive. Impulse kombucha? Not necessary. I mean, it is maybe necessary for all my little cells who are in their caftans and they need to get their little probiotic game back on point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Every time you talk about your cells, I picture a... Um, like a a donut like that you would sit on in a pool. Okay. But it's it's filled in the middle. Yes. And it everything that goes into it like fills up a little section of that cell. So mm -hmm. like there's a little bit of kombucha in there and there's a little bit of Taco Bell in there. And that's how I picture <laughs> our cells as these kind of like pie charts filled with all of the things that we put inside of our body. I'm guessing that is very true. I picture all of my cells like um did you ever see Three's Company? 
a, a few episodes. Right. I grew up on it. It was like my favorite. It was like my babysitter after school. Three's Company and the Carol Burnett Show babysat me. And uh, and Transformers. And um, there's a character on there called Mrs. Roper. And she's the landlord's wife. And she lives downstairs. And she's like this sex-crazed, caftan-wearing. The actor, I can't remember her name, Audrey. Audra. Oh, she was so fantastic. But anyway... She was always like, Stanley! And she'd come up in her captain and she'd look amazing. And uh, all my cells look like that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, I am a sucker for a captain. It, it like I would immediately fall if I was in the if I was in a pirate ship mm-hmm. and I saw a siren in some billowy threads. Mm-hmm. You better believe I'm coming over and turning into stone. Yeah. Oh, I'll fall for a captain every time. Uh, sirens don't turn Medusas. you into stone. That's a Medusa. But yes. a siren will take your voice. A siren. I think they just kill you. I think they lure you in mm-hmm. with their beautiful voice and then they like eat your soul and head and guts. Cool. Well, either way, if you're wearing something flowy, I'm, I'm going to be like, okay. You're there. <laughs> you would have loved Greek times. Medusas and sirens everywhere, all wearing caftans. Mike Glazer, dead at one day old, couldn't <laughs> keep it together long enough to do anything with his life except follow some beautiful women. I think you would have been able to wear your own caftan, too, in Greek times. Oh, man, I'd you love know? to have Rock that. Rock a toga? Yeah. Yeah. Flow behind me. Anyway. All right. Oh, I love I love flowy things on women. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll be sure to let all my cells know. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to get to our buzz of the week? Yes, please. You want to go first or second? Um, I'd like to go first, actually, if you don't mind. Please. Because it actually is tied into our Patreon that we just launched. If oh. you didn't know, we did just launch a Patreon. Um, there are three tiers. One of them is $2. One of them is $5. One of them is $8. We're going to be doing videos. We're going to do unreleased interviews. We have a bunch of dope guests in the bag and lined up. So go to patreon.com backslash weed and grub. Forward it, slash. Um, <laughs> Sorry. What's the fucking difference in the one slash? One goes one way Nobody the uses the other, the other one. Everyone knows what I mean because that's that other slash no, is never used. It is used. It's encoding and it takes you to the dark web where you get arrested because you bought opium. It's really, don't, don't go Somebody... to patreon.com backslash weed and grub because that shit will lead you down a very <laughs> dark path to a Tor encrypted website where they're selling like pounds of human flesh. <laughs> Make sure you go to forward slash. I supported you guys. <laughs> I'm just hold up a bag of flesh. <laughs> Sorry, I don't, I don't know why I felt the need to correct you on that because everyone knew what you meant and I hopped in like a fucking asshole and I'm so sorry we got a good bit out of it (laughs) please carry on so anyway my butt of the week this week is chilling with cc on instagram at chilling with cc and it's cecilia um thank you so much for supporting us cecilia you sent the nicest message it touched both of our hearts and it was very cool to you know write you back and get to know you a little bit and i just wanted to shout you out as my butt of the week for not only supporting us but seeming like a really rad human being yeah and i didn't know about the patreon message feature and it's just so neat to be able to like i don't know chat with new buds yeah it's it's fucking awesome i'm so excited about it um who's your butt of the week my bet of the week is our friend Courtney Nichols, who came on the podcast a while back because she ran the Disco Dining Club, which was this incredible uh, events uh, company here in Los Angeles. And with COVID, Courtney has launched this new amazing initiative called Of the Night, where it's basically like a party that's delivered to your house in a box. It's like an at-home experience for a themed night in. So I actually got um, our friend Heather one that was like an 80s sleepover and it showed up and it had like all of the stuff that you would do at an 80s sleepover with like a playlist and a bunch of party hats and party favors and stuff. And so Courtney's launched Of The Night, which you can follow at ofthenight.club on Insta. And she's got a... Not .com. No, it's Instagram. It's at ofthenight.club. Got it. Is the Instagram handle. Okay. And there's uh, an ifundwomen.com, uh, which is kind of like a Kickstarter or a GoFundMe, where she's trying to raise all of the capital to really launch nationwide. Right now, they're available in LA. And she's fantastic. Courtney's just like the fucking coolest. She's great. She does massively cool stuff. And she's um, looking for people to follow uh, at ofthenight.club on Insta and get the word out. And if you have access to buy one of these packages, they're fantastic yeah they are especially right now when i'm feeling a little weird because my birthday is on sunday and so the idea of somebody showing me a great time through being the exclusive party person for the entire country like that's what i want in my life i want somebody who can just like be like i got you let's go let's have a great time 
Awesome. Yeah. Well, I'm excited to celebrate your birthday with you. We'll do something cool. Let's do something cool. I mean, yeah. I know what I'm going to do. What? what? Just like hand, it's, it's a full moon on my birthday. Oh, that's right. So I'm going to take a handful of mushrooms and howl. Ooh. Yeah. I'll do that with you. Let's go. Okay. All right. You want to get to our <laughs> VIB, our very important bud? Before we do, I would love to just say thank you to everyone who supported us to get us to South by Southwest. Yes. We... We're so proud to be part of the incredible lineup at this year's festival and the people who helped get us there, Zoe Wilder, our incredible guests, Open Mike Eagle and Laganja Stranja, just, you know, everyone who supported us. Everyone who us voted for us. Yeah, thank you all so much. It was like a true fucking honor to be at the festival and meet and connect with all the um, other panelists and watch some incredible keynotes. And it just felt really cool. So thank you, everyone, for getting us there. And we hope we can attend in person next time. Yeah. Yeah. I think we made an impact, Mary Jane. I think we made a good impact for the right reasons there. Nice. For real. Like, it was a big honor, and I'm really proud. And I also think um, the response we got tells me that we made a difference in this cannabis biz. Cool. In the right way, and that feels really nice. Yeah, it feels good to have open, funny conversations about what's going on, you know, because so much of what's going on is so upsetting day by day you know everything is is difficult and and upsetting and it just felt good to kick it with a couple of uh artists who have you know very serious intentions in destigmatizing weed but also they're just fun and funny and they're able to think about difficulties in a creative way that makes it easier to sort of listen to you know pow and that's what i think we want to do here as well so pow yeah <laughs> should we get to our vib bill oakley Living legend. Holy smokes. Incredible, incredible guest. With his writing partner, Josh, um, they <laughs> they created some of the most formative Simpson seasons of forever. If you have also seen Portlandia, he was a writer on that. Disenchantment, he wrote on that. On the food tip, the rap called him the Gordon Ramsay of fast food. Vulture called him the preeminent fast food critic. And Chef Irvine from freaking Food Network said, the nation's foremost foremost authority on fast food. Follow him on Instagram, at that Bill Oakley. Every single video is so funny. They are a minute long. He has an authentic, honest way of talking about new fast food items that is not only hilarious, but informative, kind of like we try to do on here. And thank you for the steamies which is your year-end wrap-up award show on your Instagram. Bill Oakley, you're an incredible human being. It was such a fun hang. It was just like awesome. At one point, he had to get up and um, go answer the door because he had had a delivery of something that he was going to be putting on his Instagram that day. And it was just like, he's so stoked about like experiencing everything that the world has to offer from fast food to the toy line of his that we talked about and all of the incredible writing he's done. He's so funny. What did you, What's the word when you make a lot of stuff? Um, b- prolific? Prolific! That is it. Okay, great. I got in your brain. I got it. <laughs> you got it. I got there. that one. High five. Yeah. <laughs> Shall we? Yes. All right. Without further ado, here's our interview with Bill Oakley. Bill Oakley, thank you so much for joining us. This is an absolute thrill. It is an honor to be here. I've I've heard about your podcast and I've read about your podcast, and uh, I'm delighted to finally be invited. We would be remiss not to, if we didn't start with congratulating you on your Kickstarter for the Sneaker Sniffer being fulfilled in 53 hours. Hey, thank you very much. Um, we're, I'm thrilled that this fun, this thing has been in gestation for over three years and i'm delighted that we finally are going to get to make these things would you mind giving us a little uh encapsulation of what the sneaker sniffer is and how it came to bear yeah like how, how, how did you come up with this basically uh i decided i wanted to make a funny product <laughs> and what happened was i think we were actually driving you know everybody knows what funko pops are right and i uh we were actually the family was on driving to that funko pop uh, museum, Funko Pop headquarters, which is like a museum in Everett, Washington, right? And and I don't really like Funko Pops because I don't like the eyes. I like the ones that look like what they're supposed to look like. I don't like the stylized Funko Pops. And I was like, you know, I should start making my own figures. And then I, it sort of occurred to me, hey, I could make funny figures. I could sort of, I could parlay my <laughs> my funny career into making funny figures. And then I was like, I started thinking about wacky packages, which. I grew up with a lot of people who are younger than than 45 do not know what wacky packages are but they basically were these stickers and everybody in this 1970s they were the rage every kid wanted they're kind of like they kind of had a mad magazine vibe to them and they were funny uh, they were parodies of products 
So, you know, they would just be, they, they would be funny, cartoonish drawings of f- familiar products with giving, given funny names and stuff. And so I was like, hey, wait a minute. I could do that in what I could make objects that were funny objects, you know, and, and that's where it came from. And, and I decided I was going to make a series of, of vinyl toys. And when I say vinyl toys, they're, they're not Funko Pops. They're, they're the more expensive, fancy ones that you see in comic book stores for like a hundred bucks. Um, that are made by Kid Robot and things like that or yeah, comic book conventions. Um, I could make funny ones. So I decided to make fake advertising characters from the past. You know, like uh, Captain Crunch, Count Chocula, things of that nature that, that were for some reason um, unpopular. Sneaker Sniffer, is, <laughs> is the, Sneaker Sniffer is the first one. And it's from 1962. And uh, I worked with a great team of artists and so forth. And Steve Dressler is the guy who did the ad for Sneaker Sniffer. And it's basically, it's an ad that could have appeared in Life magazine in 1962. And you get this when you buy it, by the way. The ad comes with it. It's like a, a poster. Um, it's for a foot powder. And it says, don't get a visit from the sneaker sniffer. And like, if you use this foot powder, your shoes will not attract this um, monster that comes to your closet to sniff your shoes and gets kind of a perverse pleasure out of it. Um, so that's the first That's the first one. And he kind of looks like a little bit like Dino from the Flintstones or something like that. And he's, he's a little, he's kind of a cute little somewhat... Um, perverse character and obviously that was not popular in 1962 so that's the first series we're going to do until we run out of good ideas will be unpopular advertising characters from the past this actually ties back to um the sneaker sniffer specifically ties back to all the way back when you and josh were best friends growing up because i was hoping you could talk a little bit about that fake magazine or fake newspaper that you two made together because this feels almost like with the sneaker sniffer, a full circle to some of the first things you started making as a kid. That's true, actually. Um, although it wasn't a fake newspaper, it was a, a humor magazine. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, we made it in high school, and we were best friends starting in ninth grade. And we had, um, at our school, we, there was a school newspaper, and there was like a, a, a poetry magazine, and there was a yearbook. And we both worked on the newspaper, and the newspaper only had one like one half a page that was devoted to anything amusing and and i got the wow. idea of like so fortunate uh, yeah we got uh i got the idea of let's start a magazine and this is when they are this is still back when college humor magazines were kind of a big deal like in the 80s and we and we were kind of looking at college humor magazines and we just, and and i was like let's let's make one you know we can sell it here like you know everybody these kids all have money they'll pay three bucks a piece for this and then that will pay the cost of getting it printed and so we made a magazine um uh, and I was the founder and Josh was the co-founder and it was a um, it was a big success and it went on for probably about eight years after we graduated uh, we had two issues a year and it was basically kind of a, a college humor magazine it was like 40 pages long it was a lot of in jokes about the school and some just funny random stuff um, but it was pretty I would say it was pretty professional um, I had this book about how to publish a magazine that was um, <laughs> that I was referring to and it, it, I think it was um it was unusual and it, it was um, surprising to college admissions places that I had done this, which is why I got into a good college. <laughs> you really think that it's the magazine that got you into Harvard? Absolutely. I, I didn't. My, I mean, my grades were good, but like a lot of other people with grades better than mine got rejected. I think that Harvard is looking for – I know for a fact they claim – because I did interviews. They're looking for people that they call well lopsided. So that you're generally well-rounded, but you have a specialty as well, <laughs> something like that. So, you know, that, that's why they get like the world's – that Harvard is all about getting people who are already going to do stuff and then taking mm. credit for it. You know, like the <laughs> world's greatest teenage flutist or whatever or this Olympic swimmer and, and things like that. And, and then Harvard didn't do anything. They had nothing to do with that. They just admitted the person and took credit for their success later. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Sounds that's, about right. That's the first time I've ever har- heard Harvard viewed through that lens, but it makes perfect sense. Oh, yeah. That, it's like, <laughs> don't, I think the thing about them is that they're a ruthless uh, money-making organization, and they, they, they don't – I just say I, I'm not a huge fan of the, <laughs> of the Harvard University um, ethos. And that's why I was on the Lampoon, you know, which is we were always getting in trouble for screwing with them. We were watching uh, your Instagram Steamy Awards yesterday, and it seems like it's become this sort of um, – 
it's such a source of joy for everyone around you, and it seems like it's really fun for you. So it's it's it seems oh, like it's you. this huge thing. <laughs> I, I wouldn't say it's huge, but it's big enough. I mean, you know, it's it's it definitely has gotten notori- enough notoriety that I could get Jake Tapper to present <laughs> the, the <laughs> this Chicken Nuggets Award, and you know, and Robin Lopez and like Baron Holtz and all those various people. How did how did the Simis begin? <clears throat> well, I think at the end of the, the, this whole the whole. Instagram thing that my food Instagram thing was an evolution of me just having a lot of opinions about food that I would just tell people or I would put on Twitter. <laughs> and at, at some point I was like, why don't I just make a video about this? And I didn't know how to make any videos on my phone, but I knew it could be done. Um, and then I kind of taught myself, you know, if you look at my first video, it was three, it took me like six hours to string three shots together. Cause I didn't know what I was doing. Um, and now they're pretty complicated production wise. Um, and at the end, what happened was at the end of the year, again, I was going to do a list of the best of the 10 best things I had that year. But then I was like, I should make a video. I should, it's, it, it, it's always much easier just to type the stuff out than make a video. But I forced myself to do it. And I was like, I can have an end of the year award show. Why not have an award, a parody of an award show, especially like an award show from the 70s, which is kind of what I'm parodying or 70s or 80s with these things uh, and the music and the, and the, and the graphics. Um, and present these things. Uh, and I got friends of mine or people that I knew on Twitter to to be like the celebrity hosts and, and give the awards. And so that's it really just came from that. It was my desire to catalog the best things I had eaten that year um, and do it with some pizzazz. Yeah, we, we went to um, Bob's Big Boy Burgers last night to experience your number one on the list in advance of talking to you too. Oh my God, to. did you get it? Did you get the, yes. double, the the Big Boy? Oh my God. I think my mouth is watering just thinking about it. Like, that's where they invented the double decker burger. You know, every every other place, including McDonald's, just copied them. And there's some delicious, some the way that they toast it and the relish. You went to the one at Burbank, right? The old classic oh, yeah. one where the Beatles dined. Yeah, that's where I had it too. So good. It was great. I, I uh, moved to LA just a few years ago, so I'm still sort of like impressed by things here when, when I come around a corner and see a landmark. And it was really cool, like taking a left on uh, Riverside or whatever it was and seeing that huge neon sign and then pulling up and seeing car hop service i was like oh this feels that place like is that, so cool you know? and they got that great that. old big boy out front fiberglass big boy they got that booth that the beatles ate in and they got a nice menu of like kind of old-fashioned stuff it's um i love it and i have to say when we pulled up at the takeout window in our car i said this is you know i've never been here before and the guy was genuinely excited he was like really you've never been here before? and i was like oh this isn't a fast food experience at all like he was like you gotta order you know do you know what you're gonna get and he tried to hand me a menu it was just like the whole thing was it felt really cool that's it's cool i wish there were more places like that around for you what is it about that big boy burger that sets it apart from arguably more popular burgers it's probably the relish to be honest it's they, they have some sort of relish on that burger that is a combination it's basically probably just a combination of ketchup with relish but i believe i i could have sworn that i spoke to them or someone else asked them and there's relish and there's a couple of spices or, or, or in the relish as well and i think they might even sell it in jars but it's that it, it's an architecturally perfect big mac style double decker burger with what i consider to be a transcendent sauce of some sort i I didn't have access to a whole lot of uh, fast food because I grew up in Newfoundland, which is, um, you know, there were like a, a couple of chains. We had McDonald's, we had Wendy's, and then we had Mary Brown's, which was our local um, fried Is that good? Lunch. People have been sending me photos of that from Toronto. Yeah, I feel like you should definitely try Mary Brown's. It's a, it's a, um, it's a very specific kind. They fried in peanut oil, which coming up in the 80s was kind of a big deal. Yeah, that's the best kind of... The same, that was the same with me because when I grew up in Maryland, I grew up in rural Maryland, in northwestern Maryland. And not only was it out in the country, but this was the era when there were not fast food places everywhere. So it was a huge treat to get to go. Your parents, would, My parents would drive me to McDonald's in Washington, D.C. or Baltimore once a year for my birthday or whatever. And that's why I am the way I am now because I was deprived. Mm-hmm. It's a treat. I had my very first ever Crunchwrap Supreme last night. Nice. Yeah, we really went to a town to prepare for this. So, so we tried the Big Boy Double, which was incredible. Mm-hmm. Mary Jane tried Taco Bell for the first time. And we both tried the spicy and not spicy Popeye's chicken wow, sandwich. Wow, you guys really did prepare. That's yeah, re- we did. <laughs> that's remarkable. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. We can talk We can talk, uh, talk shop then. Yeah, exactly. Because the thing that we... We're, when we ate the Popeye's spicy and non-spicy chicken sandwich, the thing that we kind of remarked on was this is like that perfect middle ground. It's kind of a marvel because 
it's what everybody pictures when they picture a chicken sandwich. Even if you have a couple ideas on the left or a couple ideas on the right that might not hit it, this is the perfect idea of what everyone thinks of when they think of a chicken sandwich. And that's kind of mind blowing. It is. And, and that, I think that that's why it was a revolutionary item. I mean, in the past, there's only a, a few revolutionary items in fast food history, you know, like starting with like you know, chicken, McNug- you know, McDonald's cheeseburger, chicken McNuggets, things of that nature. And and this was a revolutionary item that everybody's been rushing to copy. Um, and and it, actually, it was Chick Fil A apparently that inspired this whole thing, but Popeyes outdid them, uh, and now everybody's playing catch up. But that item is it's one of the few fast food items that's as good as like if you went to a really great place and and got it. You know, most most fast food items are. Uh, are good because they're cheap and they're fast. Whereas that you could, if you got that at a restaurant, you'd be happy or close to it. Yeah. I would travel for it. I was so disappointed the other day because I ordered a fried chicken sandwich from a kind of, you know, healthy place here in LA that just totally sucked. Let's Ugh. name them. People shouldn't oh, go there. Medicino farms. It was not good. <laughs> Don't go there. <laughs> and then that Popeye sandwich was so exciting. And I saw, you know, like I saw a little ripple. There was sort of when we went to the Popeye's, of course, because of COVID, there were only a few people allowed in the, actual store at one time and so we had to stand outside and we were in a line and there was definitely like a little frisson of energy of like aggressiveness of you know maybe you weren't going to get in there like we were standing behind a couple who had been kicked out because there were too many people in there and then someone came up behind us and she immediately turned she's like back of the line back of the lines over there (laughs) I was like wow this feels like it could get aggressive really fast (laughs) that happened to me Panda Express two nights ago too and it was like there's Panda Express Man, this was the worst Panda Express experience I've ever had because it took forever. And every single person in front of me was ordering six or seven different meals. Like, I want I want a kid's meal, and this one's going to have brown rice, and this one's going to have – and then another. and the place was only, I think, two people working there. And the line was enormous. And then, yes, as, as similar to you, people started to get angry at the back of the line <laughs> and yeah. stuff. But I got out of there before it got too rough. What was your order? What do you get when you go to Panda? Uh, I get orange chicken usually, but I usually get it for the family because I don't. I mean, I'd rather have a frozen pizza or something like that. I like Panda Express, but I don't love it enough that I would rather deprive myself of of something that I really want, like a frozen pizza. Yeah, like for me, that would be either a Jack's pizza. I really love Jack's, or I think DiGiorno is good, but I think they changed their crust recently, so I'm not as big of a fan of that. Where do you fall for for frozen pizza? Oh my god, I got so much to tell you guys about the frozen pizza universe. There is, um, because this is one of my, it's probably the most common thing that I eat. And they're really, the game, frozen pizza game has really gone up recently. Like the best one, it's kind of hard to find, not so much out here because it comes from out here, is uh, Wild Mike's. Uh, Wild Mike's, and I get, and if you get the deluxe personal size, that's the best. However, I have recently discovered a few other harder to find ones um, that may be even better. First of all, if you like deep dish, uh, you know, or thick crust, the uh, Detroit style pizza from Outsiders is the best thick crust frozen pizza I've ever had. Uh, Outsiders is, is bare, that makes these specialty. You can find it at Target. Actually, they sell it mostly at Target and wow. sometimes in supermarkets. They make Chicago style deep dish pizzas. They make a whole bunch of specialty pizzas that are kind of like the lesser known and their, their Detroit style is terrific. And then I just discovered this, what is this one from Ohio? I can't even remember the name of it now. Uh, there's this one from Ohio that is a chain. Um, I can look it up. I, I tell people the thing. I tell people at the end. But it's there's a pizza chain in Ohio, and it has a name like Demartinos or something like that. That just started selling frozen pizzas, um, and I found one at Walmart, and it was probably the best frozen pizza I've ever had in my life. Uh, it's Donatos. Donatos is okay, Donatos. Donatos. And, and if you if you're lucky enough to have this, I've I've only seen it for sale one time, and it was in Walmart. But and, and hopefully wow. it will become it, it will become a more popular. I know if you live in Ohio, you can order those pizzas. But um, this was probably the best frozen pizza I've ever had. And I've been also – part. the other thing I do is I order a lot of ones from Gold Belly. You know – you guys know Gold Belly? I'm new to that because my sister sent me a care package – or sent us a care package to enjoy together from Katz's Deli in New York. And we got like a whole thing of pastrami and oh. Russian dressing and sour pickles and rye bread. Like all of the makings of sandwiches for I got, a Reuben uh, lunch. Someone sent me one of those too as a gift and uh, it was fantastic. Um, but I've also been doing kind of a pizza crawl, oh, a nationwide pizza crawl via Gold Gold <laughs> Belly, uh, and I got Demos from St. Louis. You guys live in St. Louis. You must know Demos, right? Isn't it supposed to like it's like the prototypical uh, St. Louis? Are you talking about pizza? Uh, Emos? Emos has that Provel cheese. Yes, it's Emos. It, I am Emos. Emos. Sorry, why did I say Demos? Yeah. Uh, it's because we have a Demos in Portland. It's it's Emos. You're right. So I got those, and it does have the Provel cheese is weird. Like 
it, it kind of tastes like the cheese. I never had it before. It tastes kind of like the cheese that you would have in the, in a lasagna, you know. Um, and and the, and the kids, when I gave it to them, were kind of weirded out by it. But I really liked it. So I have Emos, and I got um, a whole bunch of uh, Old Forge style pizzas. Old Forge is a style that is only in one part of Pennsylvania. That's kind of a um, it's a deep dish. It's kind of a thick Sicilian style pizza, but it's got a special a special couple special aspects. And I also got, oh, and this is another one for anybody who wants to order pizza that's a little more expensive frozen pizza, Table 87. Now that's some frozen pizza. Have you ever had that? It's, nope, it's a place it. in Brooklyn that recently started selling their pizza and it is, it's amazing. It's like, it basically, they found a way to package like slices, the kind of slices that you would just get from a place in New York and mm-hmm. um, that are like margarita with uh, basil and stuff on them. And you just heat them up in the oven and it's amazing. It's exactly like I mean, it, it, the quality is exactly the same as you would get at the actual pizza place, and it's it, it doesn't suffer from the fact that it was frozen, unlike most frozen pizzas. See, this is why it's really great to speak with you, Bill, because I'm over here being like, you got to try Red Baron. If you haven't <laughs> had Red Baron, that's the one. Well, let me tell you, just in general, if you're not if you, if it's too expensive or complicated to go through Gold Belly or whatever, you know, Costco. Has a, usually has a really good selection of frozen pizzas. And Walmart, despite the fact, if you can ignore the politics of Walmart, which is questionable, um, they always have an incredible selection of frozen pizzas, including ones that are specialty ones you've never heard of. Can I ask, when you were uh, working on, how many years were you uh, here in LA working on The Simpsons? Uh, seven years. Did you, I mean, that must have been just such a, a, like crazy long work hours and long work weeks. Were you able to, uh, enjoy all of the food that your neighborhoods had to offer when you were, when you were in LA, or was it just always food being brought no, to you? No, it was just being food being brought to us. The lunch order was a big thing because, like, this was I remember The Simpsons. This was the era before cell phones, so people did not you didn't have a built in distraction. Like you were there in the room paying attention, and and or and sometimes we're smoking. That was a distraction. You could still smoke in the office when I worked there, and so people would like Schwarzwelder especially would smoke, but I smoked too for a while. Until that became illegal in like 95 or 96, whenever it was. Um, so the food was your only distraction. And, and and it would take on an outsized role in your life. For instance, people would sometimes order an entire pie and eat one piece throughout, one piece every hour throughout the afternoon. I lost 65 pounds when I left The Simpsons. You know, it's like that's because everybody, you could definitely eat as an enter- entertainment. At least you did back then. Um, so, yeah, there was all sorts of stuff like that that we, uh, and then also, we began to abuse the system intentionally because we were mad that Fox was not paying attention. Like the Simpsons had a weird relationship with Fox. And, and so like, for instance, uh, I would order three or four shrimp cocktails and take, (laughs) have one for lunch and take the rest home. Um, (laughs) Or uh, I ordered caviar one time and that actually got around the caviar. Like people were like, people, guys at the Bill Oakley at the Simpsons, that that became my reputation outside of the, outside of the, uh, the Fox a lot was that I was the caviar orderer. Um, they wouldn't let you order any <laughs> beer or anything, though. Though we learned that the hard way over and over and over again. Um, but so yeah, the, in any case, the food became a, was the thing. Was the thing was our only source of amusement and entertainment <laughs> during those long work days. <laughs> um, starting with the first episode that you and Josh wrote together, I it feels like I, I don't know your your sensibilities and how they complement each other, but it really does feel almost like a Mad Magazine or. Uh, your magazine where you're taking what would have been a fake ad in the magazine and you're putting it on the radio to get into a scene and it's that one line joke that gets us into the scene so it feels like you were taking a lot of things that you were already really good at and then figuring out new ways to plug them in is that a nerdy way of asking how you write and what your process is i have to say that you know we did not invent the simpsons we did not. We only executed it to the best of our abilities. Like you know, it was Sam Simon, it was Jim Jim Brooks and Matt Greening, and primarily Sam Simon, from what I have learned, that invented this universe that we love so much. And uh, what happened is we just came in and executed it <laughs> the way that they had set it up. You know, even when the seasons that we ran seven and eight, we were just copying season three. We literally were co- trying to copy season three because I think that's the best. That was Mike Reese and Al Jean, and I think it's the best season of television ever created um Mm -hmm. season three of the simpsons so i would say we were attempting to copy (laughs) the stuff that we liked and i think we did so with a a, a fair amount of success um i don't we didn't bring a lot of our own we brought a lot of our own knowledge 
to it, but I wouldn't say we, we didn't bring a lot of, we didn't re- re- reinvent it in any way. We just kind of executed it. What would you say your strong suits are when when you weren't show running yet? Were you like the sniper who had one great line for this one great character? Were you like structure? You could just see structure. Like where do you find your strengths were? I'd say structure and stories. And uh, I would, I, I, I'm only probably about a medium in terms of being like the one liner guy. I'm, I'm more like the guy, I'm more like the, st- the structure and like, does this, I definitely am, am, am concerned about things like the character. Does this, is this true to the characters? You know, is the character behaving like the character is supposed to, um, rather than stretching out uh, of its universe for a joke? You know, that's that was a, a constant thing. Is like this, this doesn't sound like Homer. You know, to me, that's like I don't think Homer. Like certainly, there's certain jokes where like oh, Homer knows Supreme Court justices from the 1930s. Okay, that's fine. For one time, that's fine. But more than once, it doesn't sound like him. You know, he's a blue collar guy and, and that kind of thing. So it would, I would often be like, that's funny but it's not really faithful to the universe that we have. It's such a big universe. So w- would you just come up with a joke and then be like, oh, that should be Abe Simpson because we need somebody to pop in right here. Like, how do you choose what, what character fits where when you have like an A and a B story and then this whole world to pull from? You usually have to, in most cases, you just have to go where the story, there's not a lot of spare room. You got to tell the story. So each scene has to move the story along. Um, in some cases, especially like first acts of The Simpsons, there was definitely an era where the first act was just kind of a rambling, you know, a trip to the water park or something like that. And it was just like, let's do a big set piece. And then the story comes out of that. That part is hard because you don't like, you don't really have to tell a story. You got to make 80 jokes about water parks. And, and so that part, that it's hard, it's actually somewhat easier when you know the story has to guide you along. Um, and you don't let the character, like, sometimes you stuff in a character just for a line, like Grandpa. A lot of times you'll see, like, oh, oh, Grandpa, we didn't know Grandpa was sitting there at the dinner table with them but until he said this line, you know? And a lot of times that will be the way you have to do it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, everything is, it varies depending on the needs of the episode and the scene is the answer to your question. It's also difficult. The Simpsons is much more difficult to write, and certainly in those days, than a regular show, because on a regular, for instance, Seinfeld, you got four sets, you got six characters. Simpsons, you have an infinite number of sets, you have an infinite number of characters, not to mention, you could put an itchy and scratchy in here. You could, you know, whatever. And it's like, and so the, the, the sheer number of choices is is overwhelming. Yeah, it feels like trying to choose something on Netflix at 10 p.m. Like, I'm yeah, just going to, good you know, analogy. speaking of Seinfeld, and I know that you and Josh wrote a Seinfeld spec that kind of opened a lot of doors yeah. and opportunities. And um, Mary Jane and I just wrote a spec together about podcasters because we were tired of writing about shows and we were like, we just love doing this. Let's write about something we love. And that sounds like what you and Josh did for your Seinfeld spec. You just wanted to write about a show that you love. Yeah, that's exactly what happened, actually. Because before that, we had not had any success. We had four years of being un- basically kind of being unemployed. Uh, and it's because, in retrospect, our material was crummy. Because we wrote episodes of things like Coach. And we didn't like Coach very much, but we were like, this, we said, and it's true, this is just as good as an episode of Coach. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that doesn't get you any jobs, though, you know, and that's and finally we had a, at least two people tell us that, you know, give us that kind of wake up call and say, you got to write an episode of a show that you love. And and at that point, Seinfeld had only been on for four episodes and it was still called the Seinfeld Chronicles. But we were like, this show's so funny. And so it, people didn't know what it was. Most uh, pe- many of the people who read it had not f- weren't familiar with Seinfeld, but they but it did get us. Yeah, it definitely opened all the doors. Do you remember the plot? Yes, and the of story course. of that. Of course, story. would you share it? Yes, because it was something that happened to me, and, and I'll tell you what it was. Um, in co- you remember if if you, I don't know how old you guys are, it, if you remember Snapple, when Snapple used to come in glass bottles, the glass yeah. bottles would have a foam wrap around them and, and to keep it colder. When I don't know why. Anyway, so the, and so one time in college, I had a, I drank a sna- I drank the entire Snapple, and then at the bottom, I saw that the glass had been cracked. And it wasn't it wasn't so cracked that it was leaking, but it was cracked enough that I might have swallowed pieces of broken glass, and and not known it. And so I was like, oh shit! I was really worried, and so I was too worried to even call the doctor. My girlfriend called the doctor, and they said, well, the only way to tell if you swallowed broken glass is to examine your stool. 
<laughs> when you finally go to the bathroom, and if it's black, then you have swallowed broken glass and you have internal bleeding. So then the waiting game begins. So <laughs> basically, and then everybody's interested. Everybody wants to know what your stool is like and, and stuff. So basically that happened to George. It, just, it was in the context of a party that Jerry was hosting. It happened to George. Everybody at the party was like worried about George and wanted to know about his stool. And it was, you know, it's just a perfect kind of George Costanza type of thing. <laughs> and so uh, a lot of it was just stuff that had really happened. And, but people really liked it. And uh, it did. Like Larry David said it was the second best Seinfeld Back script he ever read. I don't know. He didn't see what the first one was, but he did. He did ask us to pitch episodes of of Seinfeld, and then he did try to hire us at, uh, at one point, but we couldn't get out of our Simpsons deal. Um, but it was a. Uh, it definitely was one of the most popular things we ever wrote, and I'm glad that those two guys who gave us the wake up call did. It. Otherwise, um, I wouldn't be doing this. It's really cool too that you could you know sort of hear the wake up call in a way that made you uh, instead of just being pissed off and doing the opposite thing, you actually you know listened to them and. Did the right it, it, it was partially due out. to the fact that Seinfeld had come on and it was like the only TV show that we really liked um, you know uh, that was on primetime comedy at that point and uh, yeah. or Simpsons obviously but you didn't write a spec Simpsons in those days um, and it also was the fact that also the foreign I was I had applied I was like going to apply to be in the State Department and so I had sent away for the Foreign Service exam and I had no idea how hard it was it's so hard the Foreign Service exam you really got to know a lot about geopolitical situations and I was like oh fuck it let's write another script that's what it was <laughs> that's, that's literally what happened Amazing. wow thank god yeah thank god well in addition to the sneaker sniffer what are the other plugs where should everybody else enjoy you most importantly go to Instagram that Bill Oakley that is what I want you know that's what I want people to, to look at is that's and that's also where you can see stuff that I'm doing every day like you know when I work on a TV show you know I'm not going to see it for 18 months but uh, on my Instagram I usually put up a video a funny fast food review video once every week or 10 days plus literally almost every day there's new stuff on my story which is generally either about Portland stuff or about all this exotic food that people mail me um, or, or you know or frozen pizzas I find things like that so that's the most important thing anything else uh, if you follow me on Twitter, I generally announce whatever I'm doing. Uh, most recently, this site gags company, but uh, or, or the show I'm working on, something like that. Uh, also, you know, we're working on this spinoff of our old show. Josh and I are uh, Mission Hill, um, and and that should that get sold, I'm hoping it gets sold. Then I'll be tweeting about that relentlessly as well. That's thrilling, and best of luck with that. Mission Hill was Thank fantastic. You. Thank you. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Oh man, the the gay couple. I, I don't know that there was another. Um, animated cartoon who was doing what you have done or were doing at the time. Well, they're the stars of the new show. Um, it's like it's like Mission Hill. It's basically just a continuation of Mission Hill, but there's a lot more Gus and Wally. They go from being the background characters to being the stars of the show. Everyone else is still in the show. Incredible. Fantastic. Thank you so much. This is such a thrill. Thank I you mean, so much. I mean, you got Mary Jane to try Taco Bell for the first time. Yep. So, And next time I go to Newfoundland, I got to get uh, some Newfoundland uh, special flavored chips sent your way because I was seeing your rating of the Canadian flavored chips and that you... We're all about the all dressed. Humpty Dumpty. Humpty Dumpty. That is yep. the best. That's the number one best Canadian all dressed chip. And it's only available in, in that, the Maritimes and in Quebec, I understand. So, yes. Yep. I would love to have some more of those. Love it. Excellent. We'll get them sent your way. <laughs> Excellent. And uh, for us, you can follow us at Weed and Grub. You can email us at wg at weedandgrub.com. Bill Oakley, thank you so much. This has been an absolute dream come true. Uh, it has been a, <laughs> nothing but a pure pleasure from start to finish. Thank oh, you so much. Please yeah. come back anytime. I would love to. Bye, everybody. Bye.